<laughs> Afternoon, everyone. A very big thank you, of course, to Sandy and Barbara and Judy for inviting me and the Myra Mayhorn Outreach Program for giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, as Sandy said, I will be more than happy to answer any and all of your questions. Uh, the talk probably won't take more than about 40 minutes in total, so there should be plenty of time for questions. Okay. All right. Let's talk about glaucoma. Glaucoma is the most common cause of irreversible blindness in the world. In America today, there are about 3 million people with glaucoma, but only about 50% of those people usually know that they have glaucoma. Glaucoma is a chronic disease. It can be difficult to determine when it started, and every patient is a little different. The clinical picture can be incomplete. Not everyone has every classic finding. So again, it's important to make sure you see your doctor if you have this disease. Um, it's asymptomatic. It causes no pain. And most patients don't know that they have any vision loss until it's markedly advanced. So what is glaucoma? So if you ask the American Academy of Ophthalmology, it is a multifactorial disease that results in optic nerve damage leading to visual field loss. So what does that mean? That means that there is damage to the optic nerve. We also call this an optic neuropathy. So there are many kinds of optic neuropathy. Glaucoma is the most common cause. Elevated eye pressure, which is separate from blood pressure. It is a progressive disease. Of course, without treatment, it is markedly more progressive. It's irreversible damage. And early detection and treatment are key to preserving vision and preventing loss from glaucoma. So a little bit of anatomy just to get you oriented. So the front part of the eye is called the cornea. That's the clear part. The iris is the colored part of your eye. Blue, brown, if you ask my mother, my eyes are brown. If you ask my husband, they're hazel. <laughs> um, and then the key part for glaucoma is right here in the back. It's the optic nerve. And this is actually a fundus photograph. It's a picture of the back of the eye. So this big circle here over on the right, that's your optic nerve. Vessels come in with the optic nerve coming from the brain in the back, moving forward towards your eyes. And they branch out into the retina. So all this sort of pink area around the edge here, this is all retina. All right, so we talked a little bit about elevated eye pressure. So to understand eye pressure, you need to understand a little bit about fluid inside the eye. So fluid is created, if you follow the blue line here, in the ciliary body, and then fluid flows around the lens. This lens is actually what becomes a cataract. You live long enough, everybody gets a cataract. So this is what it is. It goes around the cataract, through the pupil, and then out into the drainage system, which is in the angle, all around the eye in the front part. So the fluid, the other name for it is aqueous hum humor, if, you, if your doctors has mentioned that to you. So in glaucoma, usually your eye is making more fluid than the outflow system can accommodate. When that happens, the pressure inside the eye goes up, you're building excess fluid, which then puts physical or mechanical damage on the nerve in the back of the eye, which is what I can see when I look, when I look at your eye. And that's where glaucoma happens. It's high eye pressure that is causing damage to the nerve in the back of the eye. What are some of the risk factors for glaucoma? So the biggest one really is being an African American. Unfortunately, African Americans have somewhere between a three to four times higher risk than Caucasians for developing glaucoma. Hispanics are really more one to two times more than Caucasians. Um, and there's no literature to kind of tell us why there maybe is a race predilection. We don't know the answer to that. Um, being older, trying to grow old gracefully. It's hard. <laughs> so the Baltimore Eye Study, for one example, found that patients in their 70s were about three to five, three to four, roughly 3.5 times at greater risk for developing glaucoma than someone in their 40s. Family history. So the biggest ones we worry about are first degree relatives. So primarily when you come in and if I ask you, do you have a family history of glaucoma, I'm really looking for parents and siblings, those are the, the key factors. Um, other than that, high eye pressure, which is something we check on exam, 
the thickness of your cornea. So your cornea, again, is that clear part on the front of the eye. We now know that having a thinner cornea is actually an independent risk factor for glaucoma. And some of the belief is that having a thinner cornea means that some of this uh, tissues and support structures around the optic nerve in the back of the eye may also be thinner or more flexible or pliable, which may put the nerve at greater risk for developing glaucoma. But that's not 100% proven yet. And then being nearsighted. So patients that have a lot of minus in their glasses, you tend to have a slightly larger eye. The optic nerve tends to be a little tilted in the back, which can have a more glaucoma disappearance and tends to be more susceptible to developing glaucomatous damage over your lifetime. So what are some of the symptoms of glaucoma? So glaucoma primarily causes loss of peripheral vision. So as you see in the photo here, it starts on the outside and it comes towards the center. So that's loss of peripheral vision. As compared to maybe loss of vision that's associated with a cataract, where things just kind of be generally become more blurry. Some patients complain that everything looks yellow, they can't clean their glasses enough, as compared to someone with macular degeneration. So this is what causes more of a central loss of vision. What are some of the signs of glaucoma? So if you come in for an exam, of course we're gonna check all this. We're gonna check your vision, we're gonna check your eye pressure, we're gonna check the corneal thickness, and then the last part here is called gonioscopy. So gonioscopy is looking at the angles, which is where the drainage system is in the front part of the eye. So this is actually a picture of the lens that we use um, in the slit lamp to look at the angles. And this is actually a photograph of some of the angle structures. Of course, we're gonna look at your optic nerve. So the photo here on the left, this is a normal nerve. This is a healthy nerve. The healthy part is the pink tissue here around the border of the nerve. The central yellow part is what we call the cup. As compared to the picture on the right, as you can tell, there's a much larger central cup compared to the amount of healthy pink tissue. And this is what glaucomatous damage looks like on the optic nerve. There's an enlargement of the central cup loss of healthy retinal nerve fiber tissue. So some people come in and they say, well, my doctor told me to come in because my optic nerves look cupped. This is what they're talking about. You're also gonna have a visual field. So remember I mentioned glaucoma causes loss of peripheral vision. So one of the ways we check this is with standard automated perimetry, or we check a visual field. It is a sort of dome-shaped machine and you rest your chin in it and the machine's gonna flash sort of white lights and it's gonna ask you to hit a button when you see the white light. And this, so the photograph here again on the left, this is a normal visual field, this is of the left eye, as compared to the one on the right, where there's this black area where the patient unfortunately doesn't see the white lights and that's evidence of a glaucomatous defect. We're also gonna take some pictures of the nerve. We're gonna take a photograph, just like the one I showed you earlier. And this is a more specialized image. It's called an OCT, optical coherence tomography. It actually gives me a number of how much healthy nerve tissue is, is on the optic nerve. So your average 20 year old has somewhere between 100 and 120 microns of healthy tissue. And this test will actually break the nerve up into segments or pie charts to let me know if there's a specific, specific focal area that has lost tissue. So in this particular image, so the nerve on the right here, there's that red sort of uh, pi square segment here on the bottom. This is evidence of early glaucomatous defect, and this is a very classic spot to probably see early glaucomatous defect. It's compared to the patient's left eye here, which is normal. Green is good, usually on this test. So there are many different types of glaucoma. So the most common one is primary open angle glaucoma. This is your angle anatomy is open, the pressure in the eye is typically elevated, and then we typically see either early visual field loss and early damage to the optic nerve. Normal tension glaucoma is kind of on the spectrum of open angle. So normal eye pressure ranges anywhere from 8 to 22 millimeters of mercury. Average is about 16. 
But we now know that there is a subset of patients with relatively normal eye pressure, usually it's between 12 and 16, that still seem to develop glaucomatous damage. And that is the normal tension glaucoma class. Uh, you may have also read it as low tension glaucoma. Angle closure glaucoma. So this is specifically looking at an anatomical difference. So in this case, the angle is more closed and fluid has a more difficult time accessing the outflow channels. Also sometimes called narrow angle glaucoma. I do wanna make one point here. There are many patients with narrow angles that do not have glaucoma. Remember, by glaucoma by definition means there is damage to the nerve in the back of the eye. And I see many patients that are referred in for narrow angle evaluations, which we have treatment for, that do not have glaucomatous damage. So I just want to make sure everyone's clear. Congenital glaucoma. There are unfortunately many infants that are born with glaucoma. Glaucoma suspects. These tend to be patients maybe who have a strong family history of glaucoma or the nerve in the back of the eye looks a little more suspicious for glaucoma, but maybe there's the visual field is normal or the imaging of the optic nerve is normal. And these are patients we usually monitor. And there are secondary glaucoma. So patients maybe with very uncontrolled diabetes, um, patients who have inflammation inside the eye, this can either be from an infectious cause or a non-infectious cause like, a, like lupus or Sjogren's or rheumatoid arthritis um, or trauma, patients that have had blunt trauma to the eye. They can cause secondary types of glaucoma as well. Okay, so let me explain some of this open versus closed or narrow angle bit. All right, so the photograph here on the left. So fluid again, it's going from the ciliary body around the lens, through the pupil, and then out into the drainage system. So in opening a glaucoma, it's purely that you are making more fluid than your outflow tract, which is also called the trabecular meshwork, can handle. But the angle anatomy, when I look at you in, in the slit lamp, is still open. As compared to someone with narrow angles, where fluid physically cannot reach the outflow tract. These tend to be patients who actually have more plus in their glasses. They're hyperopes, uh, naturally farsighted. Um, and as we get older, the lens inside the eye grows and again eventually becomes a cataract. But in hyperopes, the eye tends to be a little bit smaller. Not side to side, but front to back. The eye tends to be a little bit shorter. So as that lens is growing over time, in an eye that's a little smaller, it is crowding the structure is in the front part of the eye, which is what makes it difficult for fluid to reach that outflow tract. And this is more angle closure. And I see patients here at New York Presby in the ER that maybe come in with acute pressure spikes from this, usually because they don't know that they have it. Um, but this is so open versus closed angle. So how do we treat glaucoma? We usually always start with eye drops. There are laser procedures that are available to treat eye pressure. And then for very refractory cases, there is incisional surgery. And the incisional surgeries are the ones that are done in the operating room. <coughs> the goal of all of this is to lower eye pressure, to prevent loss of vision, so that you never notice it over your lifetime. Now, what pressure is going to be best for you is very individualized. And in some cases, I'm unable to slow it down dramatically. But again, my goal is to reduce the glaucomatous progression such that you don't notice it. Because again, glaucoma is a progressive disease. I'm just trying to slow it down as much as I can. And in many cases, we're, we're very successful. So the medications, there are a whole host of classes of medications. Your doctor is gonna help you figure out which one of these is right for you. They all have, unfortunately, their own sets of side effects and irritations or ocular discomforts, et cetera, but those are things we, we can work with. Now this laser treatment. So the laser treatment, you may have also heard of it, it's called an SLT, is really the most classic one. The original version was called an ALT. Um, the ALT stands for Argon Laser Trabeculoplasty. Argon is the name of the laser. And then SLT is Selective Laser Trabeculoplasty. Um, probably most glaucoma physicians, that's going to be the one we commonly use now. 
for a variety of reasons. So it's selective because it only targets pigmented cells in the angle structures versus in the non-pigmented cells. And the goal is to increase outflow of fluid through the drainage system here. So it's just a cartoon character for you showing how we treat the angle structures. And this is something that's done right in the office. Now, what do we do about those narrow angles? Because I mentioned that we do have treatment for those. So for narrow angles, we do what's called a laser iridotomy. So again, the fluid is having trouble reaching its outflow tract, the trabecular meshwork. So we do a laser procedure to allow fluid an alternative pathway to reaching the drainage system. So I make a very small hole. You're never going to see it. It's in the colored part of the eye. So that fluid, instead of having to go around the lens and then out through the pupil and around, goes right through the hole and accesses the drainage system. And this is a photograph showing you what it looks like to me in the cell lamp. So most patients never even know they have it. Um, it's usually a one-time treatment. You do one eye at a time. And the goal here is to prevent the patient from having an acute spike or uh, acute glaucoma. <clears throat> So for patients that unfortunately, despite medications and lasers, still have advanced glaucoma, what do we do for them? That's usually when we have to talk about surgery and going to the operating room. So there's two main types of glaucoma surgery, and this is the first one. It's called a trabeculectomy. So what do we do? So this is actually the top part of the eye, underneath the top part of the eyelid. And we make a flap or an incision with a very small hole that connects the inside of the eye sort of to the outside of the eye. And we create a bubble, or we call it a bleb, on the top part of the eye. So think of it as an external reservoir for fluid to circulate outside the eye so that the internal eye pressure is reduced. And this is actually a photograph of what one looks like. So this little bleb or the bubble on top of the eye is holding some fluid so that the pressure inside the eye is reduced. What's the other option? The other option is a glaucoma drainage implant. And there's a couple different types of implants. They're all made of silicone. Um, they're well tolerated in the eye. And it is a small plate with a tube that is sewed onto the outside of the eye. It's way in the back underneath the eyelid. You're never gonna see it within this small little tube that goes inside to drain the fluid out into more of a controlled plate. So the one here on the left, this is called an Ahmed valve. The one on the right is called a bar belt. And your doctor will help kind of walk you through which one is probably the best option for you, but this is, oh, it's a very successful procedure. Both of them are. And this is actually what one looks like inside the eye. So you can see the small little tube here on the inside of the eye, and it's draining fluid out into an external reservoir to lower pressure inside the eye. This is permanent. It usually stays in the eye. So in summary, glaucoma, again, is the most common cause of irreversible blindness in the world. It's a disease of the optic nerve or an optic neuropathy usually goes undetected until damage unfortunately is severe. No one is really exempt from developing glaucoma, including myself, but people who are more likely at risk are gonna be African Americans, people with strong family history, and unfortunately getting older. So screening is very important for glaucoma. It's about early detection. So. People really of any age who have glaucoma to symptoms or feel like they have extensive family risk factors um, or family history or risk factors should see an ophthalmologist for an eye exam. And some people will say, well, doc, how do I know I'm having symptoms? Because most people don't feel elevated eye pressure. So usually what I try to tell people is when you're driving, have you had any accidents recently because you were trying to switch lanes and you didn't see the car coming either on your right or your left? And they may say, oh, yeah, I had a near miss last week. It's usually because that's the, some of the first signs of that peripheral vision loss. Because our, our eyes are meant, we, we adapt to that. So as we start to lose vision, you may not realize it, but you actually may be using one eye more than the other to compensate for those areas where you're not seeing as well. Um, I usually recommend anyone over the age of 40 at least have a good baseline eye exam. 40 is usually about the magic age where you need reading glasses anyways. So most people may find themselves in an eye doctor to begin with. 
Um, and then of course, everyone probably over the age of 65 should probably see an eye doctor about every one to two years just to make sure everything is still doing well. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions.